All righty then, another good day in the neighborhood. How you doing back there in the booth, John? Doing really well. I'm so glad the weather's cooling down because my hair just can't take all this heat. I know, it's frizzed up really bad. <laughs> You're like you're, you're like a, you're like basically this big ball of cotton. I just got this afro on the top of my head. Anyway, today I have a call-in guest calling all the way from Minnesota. I have Mr. Ronald V. E. Griswell, and he was recommended to me by John Griffith. You know the guy we had on from uh, the dancing video. So how you doing, Ron? I'm doing well. How are you guys doing? We are doing excellent here. What's the weather like over there? Oh, it's cooling down pretty fast over there. Uh, probably about in the 70s right now. It's perfect running weather. Perfect. Oh, yeah, that's about what we have. So when I was looking at your bio, I mean, you have done so much and continue to do so much with the different programs that you're in. So let's just jump right in and tell me exactly what it is that you do. I am an outdoor educator with company Wilderness Inquiry. Wilderness Inquiry is a nonprofit based right out of Minneapolis, Minnesota. And as an outdoor educator, what we, what I do, and what other uh, people in my position do at my company, we pretty much take youth out on the Mississippi River, uh, pretty much teaching them environmental literacy in partnership with the National Park Service and a couple of other partners that we have. And we take that program. We implement it throughout the country, so not only here, but also in New York City, and Washington D.C., in Chicago, Philly, uh, pretty much all over the board. Now, when you, uh, when I look at this and I say you take people canoeing on the Mississippi River, now, you know the stereotype: black people don't swim. <laughs> do, you, <laughs> do you have that problem with people going, "Oh no, uh -uh. <laughs> that, <laughs> that's too much that water." Is. That is very, I mean, that is one of the uh, one of the stereotypes, and it is a true stereotype. Um, a lot of times we get people out there, and that's the first thing they say to us, I cannot swim. What do I do in case this happens? Yeah. So kids come out there crying. You're like, why are you crying? And the kid, as they're sobbing through tears, I can't swim. Like, it's okay. <laughs> We're going canoeing today. We're not. Well, you know, <laughs> we're a not going swimming. yeah, a canoe could tip over though. That's just a teeny tiny boat, and you in the Mississippi. Oh. So let me tell you about our boats. Our boats are twenty-four foot long Voyager handmade canoes, right here in St. Paul mm -hmm. by Northwest Canoe Company. These boats fit ten people in them. What? So the boat is already heavy enough, topping out between two hundred fifty to four hundred pounds, with the additional weight in the boat. The boats are extremely heavy and extremely, extremely sturdy. So it's very easy and safe to implement our program across the country because our boats are so safe and everyone is required to have a life jacket and everyone's with an experienced canoe paddler. So we make sure that we take all those precautionary steps because it's quite different doing it here in Minnesota and then going to New York and that's a totally different population when it comes to being on the river. Yeah. Well, I think the people in New York are probably used to being in the water more, I would think, because they're like sailing and beaches and different things like that. Now, in Minnesota, you have beaches and stuff like that. I mean, all I know is what the 10,000 lakes or something. <laughs> oh, that's all I know. That's all I know about Minnesota. I, you know, I have relatives that live there, but I've never been. So I don't, I wouldn't even know if they said we're going to Minnesota. I'd be like, well, what are you going to do in Minnesota? <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot of lakes there, but I mean, honestly, I felt the same way before coming here. I was like, what in Minnesota? I asked everyone, I was like, isn't it cold up there? Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Um, don't they have the Vikings? Like, yeah. That's about it. Oh, the Mall of America, which I still have yet to go to. I but, haven't been uh, either. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. There's a shopping center that Lisa hasn't made a pilgrimage to? That's right. I haven't been to that one yet, but it's coming. <laughs> uh, if I may say, though, um, how you made the comment a while ago how the people in New York are more prone to the water that's not necessarily true. The population we're working with when we go to these cities are inner city area youth, urban communities, urban kids. Okay. So these are communities that pretty much fear the water, always been told, don't go near the river, don't go <laughs> to the river. Right. They only see the river as a means of transportation by a bridge, you know, going over the river. Yeah, so yeah. When it 
comes to going to these communities, they are very, very frightful of it. Well, I don't blame them. I always say that if that's too much water, I can't drink it and I can't swim through it, so I'm not getting in it because <laughs> I can't swim either. <laughs> but I can backstroke now. Put me on my back. I'm gone. <laughs> that's the thing. Everyone has a PFD. We tell them, look, you don't need to know how to swim. You're going to float regardless. Yeah. If anything was to happen, you're going to float regardless. So, but we avoid all of those situations. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so now it says you have, what is the uh, canoe mobile program? Because the canoe mobile is pretty much an uh, extended portion. So here in Minnesota, when we take youth uh, paddling down the Mississippi River, um, it's pretty much our UWCA program, UWCA meaning Urban Wilderness Canoe Adventure Program. Uh -huh. And the canoe mobile is an extension of that. Um, it's a play off of, I know you guys are familiar with the bookmobile, correct? Oh, yeah. Bringing, bringing reading literacy yeah. throughout the country. So what we're doing is bringing environmental literacy through our canoe mobile to each of the inner city areas. Mm -hmm. So does the uh, canoe mobile look like a big canoe, you know, like the banana boat thing that drives around? <laughs> <laughs> it, it unfortunately does not. It unfortunately does not. I had talked to someone about that, and um, they work for Disney, and they said, you, you need to Disney-fy your rig. You need yeah. to Disney-fy it. I mean, it needs to be canoes, you know, sticking out from the side of the actual van, and just like the, what is it, the Oscar Mayer. The, uh, the Wiener, Wiener yeah, the Wiener yeah. Mobile, and then there's <laughs> a, be... <laughs> the Banana Mobile, you know. I mean, yeah. keep, that way kids will flock to it because they'll be like, wow, look at that. You know, maybe they'll get over yeah. being afraid of water because they'll want to be in the that canoe. Is, that is true. Um, Nature Valley sponsored and wrapped our Canoe Mobile van um, last season. So we still have this wrap van. It has all these graphics on it from kids to canoes to different cities. So it's a very, very colorful and unique van. And on top of that, we're always towing these six packs of canoes behind us. And these canoes are huge. So we look like a small semi-truck colorful semi-truck coming down <laughs> the highway. <laughs> I know, I know. So now, when I look at your picture, you look like you're very young. So how did you get started in a program like this? So I am uh, young, I like to think. So I am 23. <laughs> oh, man, I, I got purses that old. <laughs> <laughs> You realize uh, that's we've known that's each other, Lisa, about as long as this guy's been around. The yeah, we've, we've known we've known each other longer than you've been alive. <laughs> Y'all can't be playing me on the radio. <laughs> <laughs> that's what we used to tell our students because we both used to work together and we had students uh -huh. that was born like in the 80s and we're both going, what, 80s? <laughs> you know. <laughs> oh, God. Well, but, um, yeah, well, Go ahead, John. I was walking around with ticket stubs in my pocket older than those kids. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I got ticket stubs that old for her. <laughs> he likes to save things. I'm trying to break him of that habit. <laughs> oh, my God. My dad is a hoarder. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I know that feeling. <laughs> But but yeah, when I see when I see you, it's like such the the young people. I always get interested, and I see young people doing things, you know, to this magnitude. That's why I say you look so young, and it's like, how did you get started in it, and how long has it been going on? Okay, so with Witness Inquiry, I got started last January, uh, so January 2013. I um, an aspect, and when I compare myself to everyone else, I'm pretty much uh, new to this. And um, I started last year, January, I was rounding out my senior year at uh, North Carolina NC State University. And it was, I was honestly, you know, being honest to myself and others, you know, I was having a lot of problems, whether that was getting into like just random trouble or, <laughs> you know, just not really, <laughs> I'm being honest. I'm looking at what you wrote really on here. <laughs> <laughs> they say you got into between random altercations at parties and not attending classes. <laughs> yeah, I honestly just wasn't all there. Um, so I really had to evaluate, you know, what I was doing. And I really, here's what I asked myself. I asked myself if 
I was to graduate now, what I feel like just would be worth it. And I told myself no. So I remember calling my mother and father, had a conversation with them, and, you know, I was like, I, I want more under my belt before I graduate from college. I want to achieve something. I want to be a part of something. I want to experience. I just don't want to, you know, graduate now. And then it's like, well, what have you done? So um, she said, if you could do anything and money wasn't the issue, what would you do? And I told her, I, I'll do outdoors. Uh, I was one of those kids growing up, you know, I adored and just was so inspired by, like, oh, Ali, um, the crocodile hunter and all these, all those EO figures, all those explorers, and that's what I always wanted to do ever since I was a child. I just want to be out there in the wilderness, I don't know, <laughs> with a bear. What a, <laughs> with a bear, now did, it may be. Did they give you a, do that. Right, did they give you a big old knife like Crocodile Dundee <laughs> when he said, now, this is a knife? <laughs> Cause I'm a country girl. Yeah. I'm a country girl, and I lived outside. Our parent, my grandmother, didn't allow the kids to be in the house. You know, it's got things to do. So we were outside climbing trees and doing stuff all the time. Fortunately, I grew up the same way on the out right there uh, in Blue City, North Carolina. So I grew up uh, right there in a country area, but at the same time, we were in close proximity to the beach. So it was like this country southern lifestyle, but also this like beach bum lifestyle oh. <laughs> so just relaxing on the beach all day or being at grandma's house till you know from the morning till night just playing high yeah. seat with all the family and friends yeah. like deep into the woods or in the fields so I mean I grew up like that and yeah. I really wanted to get back to things that made me happy things that I appreciate doing things that I felt rewarded after doing and after I found um, after I went through all of that I found WI and read their mission, and it's about helping people and being outdoors. And I thought to myself, what two other, what more could I, you know, possibly want from my company? So I got in contact with them, and stayed in close contact with them for a course of uh, a week or two. And before I knew it, knew it, I was on a flight leaving uh, Norfolk, Virginia. I'm sorry, Greensboro, North Carolina, actually. That time, flying here to Minneapolis, Minnesota, to start the program. So now, yep. <clears throat> with, with you being a country boy and a lot of the kids these days are more into PlayStations and stuff like that, did you find it hard to actually find kids that were interested enough to get outside and do stuff and not be connected to cell phones and stuff like that? Well, that's, that's kind of a difficult one right there because a lot of times the youth we work with we're partnering with a school or a certain organization, and they're giving us these students, you know, just, okay, here's our students, take them, we want to incorporate them into the program. So, you know, we're really not asking them a lot of times, is this something you want to do? It's more of a, this is a field trip for them, or this is, um, this is inputted with their curriculum. So this is something that's uh, almost, in a way, kind of uh, mandatory for them, for certain students. Sometimes we get individuals, uh, students, where we hold these programs and we ask, you know, okay, who's interested? Would you like to come? And a lot of times I do hear those things. Um, is there going to be uh, outlets out there so I can charge my iPhone? <laughs> right. Like, is, is, uh, there no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. is there a Wi-Fi? Is there a Wi-Fi? I need yeah. to Instagram these photos. Yeah, I'm yeah. Like, no, there's not. But, I mean, uh, it's, it's really interesting because I tell them, you know, you can still use technology in the outdoors. Mm. And of, as of lately, there's all these technological advances that just make technology really, really fun outdoors. So I try to push that. Even though a lot of these youth may not have those certain devices, I may have certain devices that I may take out with me just so we can um, use them or, you know, just have a good time. And absolutely, sometimes I just say, no, we don't need these. We're going to do this instead. Right, right. We're going to go outside and we're going to, some kids, you know, they just like to dance. We're going to go outside and dance. We're going to go outside. We're going to sit down and draw what we see. We're going to have an art class outside. We're going to do photography lessons outside. So yeah. I try to incorporate different ways in which, you know, they won't even have to think about their cell phones or everything else, blow dryers and all of this stuff. <laughs> what? No blow dryer? <laughs> uh, it happens. It happens. It happens. Well, what about 
What about uh, like at risk kids? Do you work with any of those? The ones say like this in the juvenile system that you know just are cut ups and they can't figure out what they want to do. Uh, I do. Uh, last year, I had the opportunity to work with a national park ranger here, and together we partnered with the YMCA's intervention program, working with at-risk youth. Mm -hmm. And we developed this program, and they were call we called them weekly wilderness sessions. At these weekly wilderness sessions, we'll meet these same group of kids as long as they want to keep coming out. These same group of kids once a week for I think five weeks and after the and during these five weeks every day they came and we fished and we cooked outdoors that was our thing oh. we fished and cooked outdoors mm -hmm. same thing just so we can get them accustomed to one type of recreational activity rather than you know uh getting them too discombobulated with too right. many things going on so we just stuck to fishing and cooking outdoors and then they continue to come for each of those five weeks at the end of the program we did an overnight trip, and at the overnight trip, we gave them fishing poles to keep and continue to use throughout the rest of their lives as the fish poles hold up. But, yeah, oh. uh, we definitely did work with them. Yeah, that would be nice to give out the fishing poles. My son loves the fish. <laughs> no, so now is, the only thing is he won't he he won't uh, scale a fish or he won't eat a fresh fish or nothing like that. They have to come from the store. <laughs> <laughs> I told him he, he go he went fishing one day and he brought these nice big fish bluegills him and the neighbors he brought them home he was so proud of them we took pictures of them and everything but as far as scaling them no not touching them and I said well you know I here I, I gotta scale them and clean them he did he was like uh uh I was like now you supposed to do all that that's what true fishermen do uh uh not touching them. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I don't understand uh, that part of it because <laughs> when I fish well, I did it the old fashioned way we had cane poles and a big a big bucket that you set on so every time you snatch a fish up you throw him under the bucket and then you sit on the bucket to keep the fish from running away <laughs> <laughs> wow that's the that's the real sport of fishing right there yeah the real sport my grandmother taught right me how there. to fish my grandmother was a true fisher woman she taught, taught me how to fish and I don't mind playing in worms, and, you know, I ate mud pies and all that stuff. The kids wouldn't know anything about that. You didn't eat the worms, did you? <laughs> no, we didn't eat the worms. That's fear factor. <laughs> How to eat worms, right? <laughs> yeah, you know, fear factor style. I did have a cousin that ate them, though. He always ate crazy stuff like that. He would eat bugs. Oh, and, no. Yeah, he was one of them boys that was a true boy in the South. You know, you, it is, you see a cricket, mm, crunch, 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 you know. <laughs> But, Are you serious? Yeah, he ate a, he <laughs> ate crickets and he would eat worms. You know, he he'd come up and he'd have all the bait dirt around his mouth. <laughs> It'd be like the kids eating the white powdered donut with around his mouth. He'd be like, "Who ate my worms?" Be like, "Not me." <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, I've never done anything to that extent. Oh, now see, never. that's your next adventure. <laughs> that's your next adventure. I expect to see a video of you eating a worm Fear Factor style. Oh, God, please don't. Yeah, that's my challenge. You're an outdoorsman, you got to eat a worm. Have you ever watched Fear I got Factor? To eat a worm. Jeez. Yeah. Uh, have you ever watched Fear Factor? I have watched Fear Factor. Too many times. Well, there you go. Get ready. <laughs> I better see a video of you eating a worm. They should call it Yuck Factor. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I agree with you. I, yeah, Yuck Factor. I definitely. love it. I love that show because they come up with some stuff to eat, and it's just like, bleh. <laughs> <laughs> All I can keep thinking about from Fear Factor, and it's not even worms. They one day, I remember this show because it completely grossed me out. They ate the hugest spiders alive. And I, I can still see the image in my head. I think as soon as I saw it, I just ran to my room. Oh no, <laughs> I mean, no! I ran to my room, but I, I just stayed there. That was I not safe. No, no. In my room after watching that. Uh, uh. That's yeah. not. That's not the grossest. I'm gonna tell you what the grossest one was when they blended up a rat in a blender with some other with bile and other stuff and made rat shakes and they had to drink it down. Now, they had some big old New York rats that they put in blenders and ground them up, hair, tail, teeth, everything. 
and then they had to drink it. Now that was gross. I almost threw up. Whoa. And I Is had that safe? Well, I don't know. That's what I always say. I mean, was that safe? It doesn't look sanitary. It, it doesn't look <laughs> like you'd want to put that near your mouth. I tell you that. What about that guy who ate that, who drank that bull semen? It wasn't a jackass or something like that. Yeah. Oh yeah. I would have grown. Oh, I, I would have. Yeah, that's a whole different realm. That's, well, that's, just think. You only have to mm. eat a worm. You only got to eat a worm. So you don't have to worry okay. about all that. <laughs> You guys got, got a good way of, say, of, of, of selling uh, a point because after you compare that one worm to all the other stuff, I'm like, a worm doesn't sound so bad. No, right no, now. I'm worm, on see? The grill, that... <laughs> on it. It's not bad it's with hot good. sauce. <laughs> Meal, yeah. Mealworms aren't bad. Mealworms aren't bad. Crickets, I, I, they're not bad tasting, but I got one of their little things off their legs stuck between my legs. See? See, yeah, see listen to him. Bad. Listen they're to not him. Bad. <laughs> Crickets aren't bad, you know, they're not bad at all. Just have your floss ready when you eat them. (laughs) (laughs) Now, coming from the beach area, always eating a lot of crabs growing up, I have to say, nothing tastes bad with a little Obey seasoning sprinkled on it. See? A little sand, a little Obey seasoning, what the heck? That's all you got to do. A little (laughs) Obey seasoning and eat it raw right there. Uh, (laughs) Oh, gross. So now you have, <laughs> you have uh, on here it says uh, you found y- yourself working for Association of Partners for Public Lands uh, Bridges, Bridge to Tomorrow program. What is that? Okay, uh, Association of Partners Bridge to Tomorrow program um, is a way to bring in millennials, uh, people under the age of 35 or just, you know, young adults, on working in the outdoor industry and pretty much build up a larger network so, you know, they can proceed with these programs that they want to do and actually have uh, support and not only support but extra resources and with that mentors along the way. So, I mean, I found it very helpful. For one, the way I ended up in it was extremely, extremely, I can't say lucky, I, I say blessed. Mm-hmm. I was talking to, we were in D.C. doing Canoe Mobile, and uh, one of the supporters of the Canoe Mobile, um, Vice President of Defenders of Wildlife, Don Berry, he uh, saw me at a shindig that we were holding, and uh, we started talking. He asked me, have you ever heard of uh, Audrey Peterman? I said, hmm, the name sounds familiar, but no, continue. So he told me about Audrey and Frank Peterman and how, you know, this African-American couple and how they pretty much explored uh, most of the parks in the, con- in the country, and they do all this environmental work, and that sounds amazing. And he said, I would love to get you in contact with her. So I was like, okay, go ahead, go for it. <laughs> and uh, a few weeks later, I find myself, you know, talking to this vibrant, wonderful woman with the best Caribbean accent. She is just such a joy. And she asked me, have you ever heard of Fisher Department of Public Lands? I said, no. She said, there's a program I'm going to, in her words, there's a program I'm going to get you in, darling. Just wait for it. <laughs> <laughs> and the next thing I know, she sent me this information, and I have a short time, not a short time, but I have a, a decent time to apply for what I apply for, and I get a position, and um, it's working with social partners of public lands as a British Smart applicant. So uh, they put us in these teams. And we go down to a conference in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and my team had to present on the topic of youth engagement in the outdoors. Pretty much just brings up different methods and ways that you can be engaged in outdoors and not only just short-term but long-term uh, programs that have longevity. So, and that's also at that conference where I met John Griswold and did my first dancing interview with him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, he he is hilarious. Every time I see a video and he's dancing, I just crack up laughing because it just that seems to be his thing. I said, in the middle of fighting fires, you got time to dance. <laughs> so dance yeah, on, brother. Now I on. I'm down in the name Cowboy Chris Brown. So yeah. Catch you on soon. <laughs> so and then on your uh, on your Facebook page, you have the Children and Nature Networks Natural Leaders Program. Yes. Let's talk about yeah. that. That is a, I'll say that is a similar program, the natural leaders portion, but Trinity Nation Network is pretty much the leading organization connecting youth with nature 
currently doing, uh, connecting 3 million youth a year through just different programs. And those different programs have so many different arms to them because you have natural leaders who are going out and connecting youth. You have natural families, which are another portion, who are going out connecting youth, natural teachers, and all these grassroots initiatives that Children and Nature Network is doing to connect youth and families to nature. Their natural leaders program is in ways similar to the Bridge to Tomorrow program. They bring together these leaders, but it's more about, okay, we're going to teach you how to facilitate an event. We're going to teach you how to tell your personal story, where you came from, why do you love doing this. We're going to teach you how to fundraise, how to find those grants. So it was really, really getting into the meat of, okay, this is what you want to do. And it was, it was uh, more pinpointed. The, the Bridge Tomorrow was, was vague but very, very important. The natural leaders doing it afterwards helped me pinpoint what exactly I wanted to work on in different events and um, action plans. So it was they're both very similar and both very, very amazing, amazing programs. Mm -hmm. Now it says you've been around the country. Tell me some of the fantastic places you've been. Um, golly. <sighs> Where have I been? <laughs> well, it's, it's that many, huh? Well, no, no, not at all. When I was younger, uh, I started out. My parents, um, we were always like a road trip kind of family, not really getting out and roughing it. So you know, we'll do like, you know, road trips and stay at uh, hotels and resorts and things like that. So I didn't really get into camping until later. So I'm gonna go ahead and set that ground. But uh, I first started traveling doing cruises to, to the Bahamas when I was around middle school. And I've probably done uh, three, three of those. And that was my first like uh, international experience. And I was like, okay, this is really fun, you know, traveling, getting out there. And then I remember we did a road trip up to Quebec, Canada, which had to be the worst trip. Oh, no. <laughs> it was so, so look. My, I don't know who was driving, but we got <laughs> lost. We were driving through Buffalo. We were on the way to see uh, uh, what was it, uh, Niagara Falls. Oh, yeah. And somehow ended up in Quebec, Canada, out of all places. Everyone's speaking French. It's cold. They, we can't understand anyone. The food we had was, Lord have mercy, was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a bad this experience. Is all, <laughs> this is middle school. It was cool, that experience, but I was still, I, at that time, I was young naive and patient. I wanted to know how come they didn't understand me rather than me trying to understand them. Right. So uh, that was Quebec, Canada. After that, <clears throat> um, probably went to the Bahamas again and um, went to Belize, oh. Central America. <clears throat> we were in, where were we at? This was a service learning trip with my school um, as a part of Pro World. And we went there to help the local businesses of Punta Gorda, Toledo District, and Belize with advertising, um, accounting principles, just pretty much all of these <clears throat> different uh, business businesses and business uh, methods to help them expand. And that was by far one of my favorite, just most favorite times traveling out of the country. I really was in the community, living with the community. I, you know, I still have friends from the community and keep in contact with them all the time. Mm -hmm. It was so much fun. It was, it was amazing. I can't wait to go back. Yeah. So, uh, it Belize, Central America is one. Um, <clears throat> with a friend, I went to Germany. His mother lived there working uh, with the military. So we went to Germany, and for his birthday, we went to uh, Amsterdam for four days. Uh oh. So Germany and Amsterdam. Don't say uh oh. Uh oh. Red light. On. Red light district. <laughs> <laughs> I know what y'all's doing in Amsterdam. <laughs> stop. Stop. <laughs> Look, I work with kids. We can't be talking about that. <laughs> <laughs> He's a little kid. Trying <laughs> <laughs> to get me in trouble. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. It was fun. It was very cultural there. I love the. It was an international community there. It was it was amazing and it honestly made me feel as an American made me feel like I don't know, 
I'm going to say it, and bluntly, like, stupid. You know, I'll go, I'll walk around trying to find somewhere, and I'll go talk to someone. This happened multiple times every day while we were there. I talked to someone. They didn't know English, but they knew five other languages. Wow. And here I am asking them, no, only speak English. And they ask, I'm sorry, uh, Dutch, uh, Spanish, uh, Dutch, <laughs> Dutch, uh, French. I'm like, oh, man, I feel terrible. I only know one language. How am I supposed to get back? Right. So, you got to become it very, international. <laughs> it was a very, very amazing uh, economy there. Um, and the last place I visited was, Dominican Republic, um, a friend and I went backpacking and traveled across the country down there, and that is just beautiful, beautiful. You rarely hear anything about it, which is one of the reasons we really want to go. It was between there and Puerto Rico, and people always talk about Puerto Rico, so we went to Dominican Republic and spent the majority of our time in Caparete, the surfing capital wow. of the world. So, mm. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't gotten to go any of those places yet. I want to go to Costa Rica and Puerto Rico, and I really want to go to a Belize. And every time I see pictures of the blue water and stuff, all I can think about is I would love to go in the ocean, but I can't swim and I can't drink at all, so I got to get on a boat. <laughs> it will be a good cruise because I'm not a beach person, you know. Um, I just mm -hmm. I would rather do a cruise than to go and sit out on the beach because most time the sun be too hot. You know, black people don't like being out in the sun. <laughs> you can't understand stuff like that. That is what that's what I'm fighting against and other African American I know. environmental leaders. But that's you what know, a lot of them do. It's like you know when you go to the beach like that. When you go to those places, you don't see a lot of black people just laying out in the sun. You know, and that's just the fact. That's the fact, Jack. But I would go um, on a cruise yeah. and lay out, you know, sit out on the side of the boat and everything because my son and I went to Alaska in August, and it was really nice. So we stayed outside until dark because it was just so beautiful. But somewhere... Uh, what part of Africa? What did you say? What part of Africa did you visit? No, no we went to Alaska. Oh, Alaska. Oh, Africa. <laughs> That's yeah, nice. now Africa. Alaska is beautiful as well. Oh, Alaska is beautiful. All the shades of blues and greens you've ever seen. It is so beautiful. We never stayed inside. We took a cruise. It was seven days, and it was worth every penny. Oh yeah, so cruises are nice. <laughs> they cost more to go to Alaska than does Europe. Does it? It costs. Well, it does. Yeah, yeah. On a cruise, yeah, it takes. My parents were looking at about twenty some years ago. They went to Alaska, but it was more expensive to go to Alaska than it was to go to Europe at that time. Well, I don't know. I thought it was pretty cheap for two people for seven days. You know, it was it was it was cheaper to take the cruise than it was to fly in and get a hotel and rent a car. So that's why oh, we. Oh wow. Yeah, that's why we took the cruise because. You know, if we had flown in to, say, Fairbanks and then got a hotel and rented a car to drive up and down, you know, I was like, oh, no, I can't be spending my time like that. So when we took the cruise, it was cheaper, and, you know, everything is guiding you around. You don't really have to do anything but show up. I was like, yeah, buddy, I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Those cruises are a great way to experience, and especially since you brought that, you know, the price difference up, which is also something people look at, but... As I've been traveling, uh, starting with cruises and now going into a more informal style of traveling, I find it e better because each travel experience is getting better because I'm saying no to, like, the big resorts and hotels and the cruises. You know, I want to go and be, you know, in the communities, like, really experience the culture. And yeah. you don't really get a chance to experience that when you try to do it lavishly. Right. Would say. I well, mean, so. yeah, and when we were in, a, when we went to Alaska and we stopped in uh, Sitka, it's it's a little town. Looks sort of it reminds you sort of like the Wild Wild West. You know, you got the flat porches and you know it, but they have a lot of diamonds there, and I didn't even realize that. But it was like a little community, and you could walk through the community. But the best thing about it, uh, everywhere we stopped, it was so clean. There was no trash on the streets, you know, none of that stuff. I mean, it was very clean because they don't allow that there. You can't dump any water out. The ship, you know, they can't dump any water in the Alaskan waters. They can't t put any trash out. They, you know, they had, we had to wait to get to Canada to take all the trash off and, you know, dump water and do everything you know, because they can't put it in the Alaskan waters. And I said, now, that's what I'm talking about. And they tell you, if you thump a cigarette butt off the side of the ship, they're going to put you off the ship. I was like, that yeah. Is, 
that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, that's that what I said. Needed. <laughs> and when, my, when we got back home, and my son and I was looking at all the trash everywhere, he was like, "Now see, if we lived in Alaska, we wouldn't have to see all this trash." <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I'm that there. True. Yeah, I mean, once you see that culture and you see how clean it is, even the little town that looked like it was in the hood was clean. The garbage cans and everything sitting outside was clean. It was amazing. And that I thought is what that's what be implemented more. Yeah, people need to do that more. I mean, the littering here has gotten out of control. So we need some littering cops. We need cops just for littering. <laughs> you know how many times I thought about that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, I just feel like the, the fines are too lenient, and it should be more, you know, strict for things like that. And it, it's amusing to see how many people think that throwing their cigarette butt out the window isn't littering, that it's natural. It's just, you know, it's so many uh, ignorance that we need to dispel, yeah. and all this, you know, littering, it, it's just really saddening. Even looking out now at the street, you know, plastic bottles and stuff everywhere. Yeah. So. Well, that's why I think <laughs> about when you get the kids outside, do you ever have any programs where, say, you go in a community and you clean up the community? Because sometimes it, they just need to know that even though it's not their trash, as they say, you know, you still need to pick it up because, you know, you might live here and you don't want other people coming into your community throwing stuff in the street. And that's what I tell the kids on my block. You know, they just throw stuff in the street, and I'm like, you know, pick that up. And they hey, my trash. It's like, oh. <laughs> uh, Yes. I'm so glad you brought that up because um, what we do with our canoeing trips, especially here in uh, Minneapolis, is this place we stop at called uh, the Sand Flat. And most of these places, pretty much all these places we stop by are uh, state parks or, you know, these regional local parks. So we tell the youth, you know, look, we want to leave this place better than we found it. This is a public place that you can come to and spend whenever you want to. Now, be honest, if you were to come to this place again, would you want to see, you know, exhibit A, B, and C, all this trash laying around? You wouldn't. So let's leave this place better than we found it. So we'll pass out trash bags and we'll clean up before or after we sat down and had lunch and enjoyed this public area. Yeah. So that's a way that we can pretty much reach out and help the uh, park systems because, honestly, that's a hard job always trying to keep up and clean up after people who misuse the parks by just going there and putting in random fire pits or right. just leaving <laughs> all their trash behind. Yeah, so, we need uh, to have a Smokey the Bear. Kind of giving back. Yeah, because uh, when I look at the parks here, I Sometimes they, they'll have family reunions and big events like that in the park, and they have the grills out, and they just leave such a mess. You know, they may clean up part of it, but they still leave stuff. And if we don't have any resources to clean up, then it just gets overgrown, and then you can't even use the parks. That is, that is very much true. For the people that like to be outdoors. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I could pull my grill up in my backyard, and I'm happy. <laughs> Long as I don't see it in the front yard. <laughs> no, a uh, friend, a good friend was telling me, uh, you know, Josh Yabunda, um, he had told me this, and then I went and did the research. But African Americans' number one use of park is by going to that park and having like a family gathering and cooking outdoors. Yeah. That's the number one recreational use for African Americans in our parks. Yeah. Is cooking outdoors basically. Mm. Yeah, because So that is that is one way we uh, love to connect and tell them, you know, you're gonna come back here and you wanna have a party here, you know, have your birthday, whatever it may be. Yeah. Do it here. Yeah, because you don't see a lot of, of black people playing frisbee. <laughs> I didn't learn how to throw a frisbee, by the way. Uh, uh, I, never, I never could catch that thing, you know, but that's like another culture. They love to play frisbee and have picnics, and we want to break that grill out and throw some meat on it. <laughs> so let me tell you, the first time I got to Minnesota, and, you know, I'm asking, you know, what's big here? What's big? Big from North Carolina, basketball, point blank, that's everything, yeah. basketball. You got a few other things, but it's basketball. Basketball. So I get here, and I'm hearing all these different uh, sports they do. But like, oh, yeah, we play ultimate frisbee. I'm like, ultimate frisbee? What is that? <laughs> oh, yeah, we do frisbee golf. Frisbee golf? What in the world? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I happened to see that so, on a reality show. I had never heard of that before, frisbee golf. I was like, what is that? 
So yeah, it's so many things here that are it's been very interesting. Very interesting. It's a lot more diverse too. Basketball is big here. Of course, they have a they have a, a national team, but you know also they have a huge ultimate frisbee team along with you know crewing is huge. That's rolling down the river and all these other sports, uh, rugby and soccer and lacrosse. So it's a very uh, sport diverse area, I should say. Very yeah. sport diverse. Yeah. Well, that's good because if they're going to play sports, then that'll get them out the house away from the TV and, you know, get some exercise at them. And, and then maybe everybody just want to dance. <laughs> <laughs> that is, that's, that's what we got to start doing. Because uh, a lot of times I'm working with kids and honestly, I can see that they're not interested in the programs, and I have no problem with that. My whole thing is is exposing them to nature to see if they like it or not. Yeah. But just to let them know that this is still important for you to care about, even though you don't want to get out here. Yeah, yeah. Well, I want to thank you for taking the time to uh, call in and talk to us today. It's been a real joy and learning uh, what people do in Minneapolis. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, Yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun here, a lot of fun. Very beautiful area, St. Paul, Twin Cities, very gorgeous. I will tell anyone to come here and visit here as long as it's not during the eight months of winter that they have. Yeah, you don't oh, yeah. want to do Minnesota <laughs> in the winter because last year I thought we were bad with the winter, but you guys caught it. I mean, yeah, it was it was it was it was horrendous. Yeah, because we had we broke our own record. I think we had about ninety two inches of snow, and Minnesota was probably knocking on our door. Because I mean, woo! I saw it was we had so much snow. I mean, after a while, you just didn't have anywhere to put it. <laughs> yeah, you all had more snow. It just happened to be much more cold here. Yeah, but, yeah, because yeah, you guys all, to get more cold there. You guys got all those lakes to make it colder. <laughs> <laughs> they probably freeze uh, over. Well, just think if they froze over, then you could ice skate. Um, yeah, I don't do that, but yeah, they ice skate here. <laughs> ah, you don't ice skate? What? No, nah, I've tried it a couple of times. Nah, I need to preserve my ankles. I'm a runner. That's what I do. I run. <laughs> oh, you run across the ice. <laughs> <laughs> Combine the yeah. two, get a bear to chase you across the lake on ice skates. No, no. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> get some snowshoeing. It's like snowshoeing and Nordic skiing is the big thing. Oh. Like, yeah, doing a winter time. Oh, okay. <clears throat> well, you have a, a great rest of your day, Ronald, and thank you so much for taking the time out to tell us about what you do, and we'll be following you on Facebook, and we're going to be posting um, your, this interview up on Facebook and YouTube and everywhere, and you can share around with your friends and See how good you did today. <laughs> Lord, <laughs> have mercy. I know you're used to Thank it. Thank you all so much. Thank you all so much. This is really, really a pleasure. All right. Thank you and have a good day. Hey, bud. Take care. All right. So that was Mr. Ronald V. E. Griswell from Minnesota. And we really enjoy talking to him because there's so many outdoor things that people just don't do. And when I find people that try to get people outside, it just makes such a difference. And I think we need programs like that here because I don't know if we have any kind of outdoor programs here like that. I might have to do some research. Well, they, years ago, back when they still we still had an economy, I used to go camping. <laughs> and um, No, I'm serious. It was We used to have there were the state parks that I used to, I spent 18 years pretty much in one state park in the summer. Uh -huh. And um, they had some great, um, they had a ranger on there who actually did uh, arts and crafts for the kids. He also presented movies at night. They had this like little amphitheater outside, you know, a little, little mm -hmm. place. they show movies that are relevant to like, you know, um, you know, the, the environment and stuff like that. They did a, that's the first time I saw the expose on seal hunting and not, you know, and um, up there in the New Clumland or whatever it is up there. Up there in the Canada Canadian region, I forget which one it is now, but the brutal, you know, seal hunting and stuff. And so they made you more environmentally aware of stuff. And um, we also cleaned up parks. As a, and so even, the, even here in Flint, we had a scouting group, you know, the scout pack. That right. They did a lot of cleanup. Project Soar back then in the uh, 70s. We cleaned up Whaley Park, Kersley Park, uh, all the other parks. That, we did the east side here. You know, right, right. That's where the, we were located. So I don't know how many times I helped clean up Whaley Park and Kersley Park. So there were programs there, but yeah. just, we don't have I think we don't have the money now or something. Maybe when you're free, probably trying to get people to so fed and actually keep their uh, heat and lights on in the wintertime, 
you know, it's like, you know, prioritize. I mean, that's low down on the priority list. It shouldn't be, but it is. Yeah. I mean, people yeah. got to eat and got to have, you know, heat first. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So anyways, we're going to sign out today, but I want to remind everybody of my book, Hardcore Survivor, and make sure everybody buy your copy. I'm going to hold it up again. <laughs> she wants to enough so she can go another trip to Alaska. Yeah, I, I need everybody to buy my book so we can, I can take my son back to Alaska. <laughs> it's my own fundraiser. <laughs> you better, but you, actually, it's not. It's, uh, it's, it's a little bit about uh, my story of being a polio survivor and the hardships of being bullied and things like that. I mean, believe it or not, bullying has been around forever and a day. It just wasn't as prevalent as it is, it is now. You know what? Actually, I think it's less prevalent now. It just there's an emphasis on it. Well, it turns out that more people are committing suicide and different things from the results of bullying now than they did when I was a kid. When I was a kid, it was just toughen up. You know, well, they uh, would tell you, toughen up. Don't take no whipping. <laughs> so that's the thing is, I, you know what? I hate to say this, but all this overly kind of sentimental sloppy stuff, getting tough with other people who are harassing you is a good skill in life. Yeah. And, I mean, nowadays having shrinks around and social workers, I don't think that's the answer. I really don't. Okay, you I just want them to knuckle up and well, be like, that's yeah, what buddy. That's what we had to do. I mean, going to if I went to the past, if I, they always told me, go to see the teacher. The teachers are, didn't give a damn. Yeah. The principals didn't give a damn. You had to fight it out on your own. Well, and that's what you're my, on your own anyway. You know? What they used to always tell us is like, you better not take a whooping because when you get home, you're going to get another whooping. <laughs> well, that's pretty much what I was taught. Yeah, I mean, and it's like, one well, other thing is too, I mean, uh, committing suicide, I'd rather, you know what, I'd rather uh, get a kid off spire to get pumped up so they go beat the hell out of the tormentor than, you know, blow their own brains out or take... Yeah, I mean, well, I, we don't I, want any of that, and they post, uh, when they post all the bully fights on Facebook, and then they show the result of the one getting bullied really wearing them out, it's, it's funny, but, you know, it's like, it's kind of not a good image to put on Facebook, but that's what you, sometimes you have to do to take care of yourself, well, and just, anybody it tells just me, happens. Tell me, anybody who tells me that violence isn't subtly thing, okay, subtle the Nazis coming out to these other countries during World War II, trying to be passive and say, oh, please don't do this to us. I mean, that didn't work, <laughs> okay? I mean, that would not work. I mean, sometimes violence is necessary. I mean, that's a fact of life. Anybody who wants to ignore that is pretty ignorant, Okay. Because that's the fact. I mean, I saw that one video where this kid, he was a big kid. He was getting hit with a Yeah, kid. I saw he that. He slams that guy right he on his knees. body slammed him. He puts that guy right on his knees. He's got to damage that kid's knees. It was, it was so funny. He deserved it. He it, deserved it. Yeah, that one, I think that was one of the first ones I saw. It was quite funny because the little bitty kid was just all up in his face. And all of a sudden, he just took him and body slammed him. He body slammed right on his knees. And uh, I was just like, I oh. was cracking up. I went, you little <laughs> weasel, man. <laughs> You, get, you you oh you torment somebody and then you're crying with it because they took care of you. Yeah, I yeah. I mean, it's like you know, go suck it up and say, you know, I'm not I'm I'm not gonna be an idiot anymore. I'm not gonna right. do that again. You know, you want to just stop bullying people, leave people alone. Like everybody need to try to get along, work together. The world be a better place. Starting with the little kids, and if you be, if you're a leader, you're doing a hundred percent. Just try not to be a follower because that's what always gets you in trouble, and you end up either dead or in prison. So you want to be like my friend. A leader. I got a friend who always says. You know, these people are belligerent, the bullying type. Well, they don't take no crap. And my friend always say, prison's full of people who didn't take any crap. Right. That's okay. what I say. You don't need to be that kind of, that person to get your point across. You just, you know, use common sense and, you know, everything will work out. So in my book, is you can get this at lulu.com. That's L-U-L-U.com. Or you can contact me through Facebook or flinttalkradio.com. So in saying that, it's Flaming Pit. Till next week, we're out.